I'm Tommy Thomas. I want to welcome you back to the show, How to Beat the Odds. I'm excited about my guest today, Tracy Wilson. She's a friend of Joyce Green's. Her and her stepmother came in town today. Joyce had told me about a month ago about Tracy. She had shared her testimony at a ladies retreat down in Palestine where Joyce has a prison ministry, Be Fruitful and Multiply. Well, now Tracy and her stepmom are going into the prisons and sharing her testimony and people are getting free from a lot of the junk the devil put on her. Before I forget my book, God and the Gambler, all you have to do is call or write. It's free. We'll pay for the shipping. If you know someone in prisons or jails, we would love to send it to them. Send us their CID number and their address and we'll get it in the mail to them. Well, about Tracy's testimony, she went through a lot when she was young and a lot of depression, oppression and suicide and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of people today are dealing with a lot of junk like that. That spirit of suicide gets on people. And I know in the world of gambling, I speak out against gambling and people lose all their money and get depressed and, and want to just end it all. And young people today, I mean, so many young people attempt suicide today, especially in gambling. 20% of addicted pathological gamblers today that are adolescents will attempt suicide at least one time. I mean, it's rampant everywhere today. But you know, God's got a solution to all of that. When Jesus comes to live inside of us, we have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, gentleness, the old devil, he won't fool with us when we start praising God, and we can walk in total victory. We don't have to medicate ourselves and go through all that stuff. Not that I'm saying there's not a time for medication or doctors, but God wants us free from all that stuff in his timing. Well, let's meet Tracy right now. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tommy. Well, we were talking earlier and your stepmom came up with you. And where do you live now? What town? Now I live in Winsboro, Texas. Winsboro, Texas. Yes. All right. And we were talking about when you were young and all, your mom and dad got divorced. Now you're with your stepmom and your dad. Right. And that was out in California, I believe. Yes, I was raised in California by my mom. Right. Uh-huh. My well, brother and I. Okay, well, when Dad left, he kind of invited brother to come stay with him and all, and that was kind of a bitter root or seed that was planted, wasn't it? Well, sure. As a child, I wasn't, no one explained to me what was going on. I just thought, well, my brother wants to, my dad wants my brother, and he doesn't want me. And I just believed that lie and, and thought I was the second best kid. You know, when our parents divorce and all, my parents divorced, my dad left in early age and all, and it's easy to take offense to stuff because we don't understand yes. what all they're going through and why they ended up getting divorced and all the junk that's been coming against them, do we? Of course not. And then when my mom was crying, I thought, well, she's sad because my brother isn't here and she doesn't want me. And, and I had a lot of anger about that. We always want to turn it inward a lot of times, but yes. it's really not about us at all. But That's we don't right. know that when we're a little kid, do we? No, we don't know they're doing the best they can. We take right. it personal and as if the world revolves around us. Yeah, that's so yes. true. Okay, yeah. now as you got a little older, uh, you had some problems. I believe alcohol entered the picture. What happened? Right. At the age of 12, I started drinking and smoking and just escaping life because I was really a depressed, angry kid. Trying to dull the pain a little bit. That's right. And that happened, I believe you were at a party or something you were telling me? Yeah, I went to a party and someone was drinking, so I started and I liked the way it made me feel. You know, you're watching the show, I want to tell you right now, because she went to a party and it seemed like a natural thing to do. Everybody was drinking or a lot of times you go and they'll have drugs and everything. And next thing you know, we participate that because we want to be accepted or be a part of all that. And that was a lot of it because you felt more comfortable when you were drinking. Right. And then it turns to the point to where it was no longer to be accepted. It was to numb the pain and not care anymore. I didn't want to care about anything. Wow. So it went from a little thing to help me talk to help me forget about life. Wow. Okay, now you went to high school and all, and it kept on through high school, the drinking? Right, and I hit it very well. I was a straight-A student and drinking all the time. And no one knew? No one knew. No. What My, was your drink of choice? What would you drink? Anything I could find, usually vodka, hard liquor was the... And you told me you'd see the bottles and you'd put some water oh, in or something yeah. so they wouldn't know it was right, gone. Right, right. It's amazing how we can hide things and do that, yeah. isn't it? And people don't notice. I mean, a lot of times you just... You know, a lot of parents today don't know when their kids are doing drugs. We hide it well. And, and when you're doing what the enemy wants you to do, he, he helps you. He does, doesn't he? He'll help you keep it a secret. All part of his plan, isn't it? Right. And, you know, I tell people, you know, when you gamble, when you make that first bet, if there's a chance you're going to be a, 
an addicted gambler if you take that first drink mm -hmm. and you don't know why ever take it to start with. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would tell young people and all, don't take that first drink. I mean, there might be 20 people sitting around and they all take one drink and all of a sudden one of them can't quit. Right. They can't stop. If it might be poison to you, why take that chance? That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, you ended up in AA program for a number of years too, didn't you? For about eight years after, after my first suicide attempt. Now, how old were you when you first attempted suicide? I was 19. And it was mainly because I thought that I could not stop drinking and I thought there was no solution and that ending my life would be the only way out. And you came close. Well, how did, how did that happen exactly? How did you attempt suicide? Well, a, a teacher in sociology class talked about alcoholism. She was a recovering alcoholic. And the more she talked, the more I thought, that's me. And, she, and I talked to her and she gave me a number to call. They, came out to talk to me, and the more I talked, I thought, they're right, I'm an alcoholic. But I heard no answer, no solution, and I thought, if you're an alcoholic, you're doomed forever. So I locked myself in the bathroom and cut my wrist. But they kicked the door in in time, didn't they? The lady called the police and paramedics, and they kicked the door in and whisked me off to a mental ward. To a mental ward? Well, after the ER, yes, then they sent me to a psychiatric facility. All right, now this happened more than one time, the suicide attempts? Yes, and um, just going in and out of psych hospitals, I, I stopped drinking, but then I switched over to an eating disorder. Um, something, when you're in bondage, a lot of times one bondage will spread into other forms, from drugs to eating disorders to, to gambling. All right, now you came back to Texas, and what happened? I came back to Texas because I wanted to leave my problems behind. Um, I was at that point, I was in another psych hospital, and the psychiatrist told me when I was in there, in the inner sanctum of the psych hospital. Explain a little bit about that because a lot of people don't know. Okay, I had been through so many, they got to the point of putting me in the state mental ward. And within the hospital, there's an inner part of the hospital that's locked. In this, and in this little room that's locked, there's a solitary confinement room, and it's padded. And in that room, there's a bed, and they had uh, strapped me down so I couldn't even move from the bed and started uh, shooting me up with the Thorazine, doing the Thorazine shuffle. I've right. heard guys in prison that are medicated and in padded cells talk about that. That's right. I, could, I remember feeling drool coming down my chin, and I just didn't have the strength to lift my arm and wipe it away. And I could just shuffle while I was on that medication. And um, that psychiatrist told me, she looked at me in the eye, and she says, Tracy, you can't do it. You cannot live out there on your own. You cannot make it. And, and I believed her. I was a failure over and over, hospital after hospital. You know, Jesus says you can make it. That's right. She <laughs> didn't know it. that with, with God I can do all things. Amen. All things are and possible. And I was to find God. that out. Amen. We're going to go with some praise and worship. When we come back, we're going to find out what happened, how she got free, how she took those words that the doctor, that curse was spoken over when she said that to her, and that was broken because Jesus stepped up to the plate and set her free. We'll be right back after the praise and worship. I was awakened in the morning by a knocking on the door. So I got up and went to see what all the knocking was for. There stood the devil with a box addressed to me. He said, boy, I got something here I think you ought to see. I said, I know that I don't want it if it's anything from you. Cause I hate everything you say and don't like anything you do. Then he pointed with his finger and he smiled kind of sly. Cause the package said from God, they're in the corner way up high. So I said, if it's from God, then why'd he send it here by you? And he said, he always send me when there's dirty work to do. 
This box is full of misery, poverty, and shame. To perfect you through your suffering till you're worthy of his name. Well, now, I've been pretty patient, but that last line took the cake. And I just could not take no more. I'd taken all that I could take. So I told him what I thought of him and all his filthy lies. And then I fired the shot that got him right between the eyes. I told him Jesus took my sickness and my poverty away. You nailed it to the cross yourself when you murdered him that day. The suffering that I do will be for love, not for shame. I'm already worthy by his blood to wear his name. And I know my father loves me and has only good in store. So you just pack up all your jive, get away from my front door. You can write my name on packages until I'm 92. But every single one's going back to hell with you so you can pack it on up and get down the road. Said, I know my father loves me and has only good in store. So you just pack up all your jive, get away from my front door. Oh, oh. You can write my name on packages till I'm 132. But every single one's going back to hip with you. Welcome back. If you watched the first half of the show, you know I've been talking to my guest, Tracy Wilson. Raised out in California like so many of us, mom and dad split up, got a divorce. But one of the nice things about the divorce was they agreed not to say anything bad about each other. And so the children, they stuck to that. They never heard mom badmouth dad back and forth, vice versa, whatever. That's an awesome thing. And we should all think more of our children, no matter what's going on. When we're adults, we're responsible and how we act and what we say in front of our children can impact them in life and put a negative response in their life and feelings and strongholds and all that are really have a deep seated root in there. And it's hard to get free. And we need to remember that when we speak in front of our children and all that we should speak in love and caring. And that's so important to do that. But anyway, she went through that. She ended up suicidal, tried suicide seven, eight, nine, ten times or whatever. But you know, God had his hand on her because now she's serving the Lord and God protected her all those years. And what's exciting is we're going to talk to her now some more. She came back to Texas and had a vision of Jesus. And it's awesome how he came into her life. So let's talk about that a little bit. You came back to Texas. You got out of there. They said, there's no hope for you. That's right. But when you got back and you're with your stepmom and all, you saw a vision of Jesus. That's right. I had moved in with my grandmother and I was still drinking and couldn't stop. And one night before walking back to California, my dad and stepmom came over and I was drunk and had a razor in my pocket. And I saw Jesus holding his arms out and saying, I love you. In the midst of your sin, I love you. And, and I knew he loved me. And my life changed. You knew right then something happened, didn't you? I knew there was, life could be different. It didn't have to be the same. All right, now you went to church. Mm -hmm. And you started walking the Christian walk. Right, and started uh -huh. doing some warfare and realizing that a lot of the beliefs I had were from lies. And my mom and I did lots of warfare and realized that I didn't have to believe those things. I wasn't made to be an angry person. You don't just wake up cranky for no reason. I wasn't made depressed. And just read the Bible and God's truth. And that's what sets me free, sets us all free, is God's truth. Well, now, Charlotte, your stepmom, which you right. call your mom now. Right. Right. All right. She was in the Word, and she knew about deliverance and demons and all that. And she said, yeah. well, they don't have a right to be there. That's right. Well, and we learned it at the same time. She, oh, you did? She didn't have experience, and neither did I. But we trusted God, and He just walked us through it. And, and the first thing that happened that gave me a hint was when I read the story of the Gadarene man who also cut himself. I never thought someone in the Bible would cut themselves. And he was influenced by the enemy, by demons. And I thought, 
it's not me. I'm being influenced by demonic powers. And that set me free because I thought I was just nuts like they said, and I wasn't. Wow. Yeah. You know, cutting yourself is one of the most demonic things. You know, mm -hmm. my wife, Latrice, and I, we minister in the jails a lot, mm -hmm. and we find a lot of people that cut themselves. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's the powers of darkness. That's all it is. Wow. Yeah. All right, now, what happened? You've been walking this walk about eight months or so. You're getting free. Right. Okay. But then the enemy really attacked, didn't he? The enemy really attacked. I still had some problems with my anger. And as a result, I decided, well, I'm just going to have one little drink. One little drink. That's it. One, That's the lie. And that was the lie. And I swallowed it and believed it. And then the next thing I know, a few hours later, I was drunk. And I had tried to kill myself with a gun. I found a gun, but I've never used guns before. And I tried pulling the trigger, but it didn't work. And I think there's... Praise God, it didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> some kind of safety. And I didn't know about it. But I did take a bunch of pills and... My mom, or my stepmom, I call her mom. Right. Um, and my dad came home, and they happened to find me out on the front lawn. Now, she told me that she came home, and there were some unusual circumstances right. that led up to that. The porch light was on. It was dark. Right. Right. And Someone thought they saw something in the yard in and the didn't yard. know it was you. Yeah, and the dog had kind of protected me and right. a lot of things. So it was a God thing they even found me out in the dark on the lawn. Okay, now mom's there praying and, and artificial respiration, breathing in your mouth, right. doing all these things and praying and doing warfare. Right. And really, you're just about gone, weren't you? That's right, because my body, she said, was cold by the time she found me, and I was no longer breathing. And in, I was having a vision at this time where these dark creatures were coming at me and biting me, like trying to rip the flesh out of my arms and stuff and dragging, one was like trying to hold my leg and dragging me away. And I believe that as she was praying for me and I believe other people were praying because God can prompt people to pray and not absolutely, even know why. Absolutely, absolutely. I started getting, I started seeing um, swords of light come down. It was, I knew it was a sword, but it was light, pure light and just starting shooting down around me, building this, um, wall of protection and I could hear the swords like out of their sheaths and they're coming down and these creatures are just backing up and I'm being surrounded by swords of light and I knew each sword was a prayer. I just knew somewhere within me that those were prayers coming down, going up to the Father and Him answering by coming down with this protection. It was, I haven't thought about it in a while. <laughs> it's exciting. That's powerful. You know, we all need to pray. And when God puts mm. it in our heart or our spirit to pray yes. for somebody, we just break out in prayer and say, yeah, I'm going to start praying for that person. That's how the kingdom works. When we're walking and we're in the spirit and God lives inside of us, and He says, I want you to pray for somebody. Start praying mm -hmm. for them. We never know what's going on in That's somebody's right. life. That's and right. there's no distance in prayer. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Well, God surrounded you with light, the swords yes. and the victory, and they backed off. And That's instead right. of them dragging you into that darkness, God had a different plan. I was protected. And yes. When I was in the hospital, I knew what happened. I was still unconscious to people around me, but I knew I was just really messed up big time. Okay, now that was the last time you messed up, right? The last time I attempted suicide. suicide. I've had my messed ups right. since. Well, everybody, like we, all it, do. It, we all do. Yes. Praise God, there is no condemnation. Right, Christ that's Jesus. right. <laughs> but that's when he really... He, I realized I was like Jonah in the, the belly of a fish and started praising God and he started giving songs to me. Um, I came out of the hospital singing. Okay, now tell us a little bit about your music. Uh, he started giving you songs, you started writing songs. Right. And you'd never right. done that before. Well, I had tried, I played the guitar a little bit. I took about four lessons when I was 18. Right. Um, That's not very many lessons. No, no. <laughs> couldn't afford anymore. <laughs> but now you can actually play the guitar and the songs, someone was telling me about the songs are beautiful and they're from the Lord. I just listen and, and he just, they just flow out. And I just know it's God because if I try, then it stops. Right. If I let go, it just flows. Well, there's also healing in your songs because they'll touch different people and they'll get healed. 
Right. Sometimes I don't know what I'm going to sing when I'm singing. Right. But um, someone needs to, I even sang one time about a dog that was depressed. And I thought, oh, Lord, why am I singing that? But a lady was in jail was worried about her dog. Oh, so wow. So I just trust God that you don't, it may sound silly to you, but if he gives you words, trust that he's it's doing it for a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Now, what happens next? You started singing songs. You started going into the prisons. Right. Okay, talk to us a little bit about that. How did you go into the prisons? How did that start? Well, it started in a few ways, but the major way is a friend of ours, husband, ended up going to prison for child molestation. And we were supporting the family. As a result, we got kicked out of church. When I was... They kicked you out of church because you were supporting uh -huh. the family and needed yes, help? I'd been a Christian for six months and got kicked out of my ch first church. Um, but I had started singing and God opened the doors for me to sing in a few churches. And someone said, well, we're going to a prison. And it happened to be where he was. And they said, come sing. So we all went. And I mean, they hold church in prison now. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah, yes. we go in ourselves. And I mean, they have right. some of the most powerful services. Mm -hmm. You know, people are always talking about jailhouse religion and that stuff's not real. My wife and I are going down to a prison in a couple of weeks, one of the maximum security prisons down outside of Palestine, Texas, a place called Tennessee Colony. But there's probably two or three hundred guys in there that all come together every week, four to five days a week. They have a praise and worship team, probably 30, 40 guys, and they just praise the Lord, and they're deep into the Word, right. and they're hungry for God. Yeah. It's real. I mean, I mean, yeah. sure, some of the guys, they throw their Bibles away when they get out, and, you know, for right. whatever reason. It's the same on the outside. That's exactly right. But right. there's a lot of guys on fire for the That's Lord right. and God's doing an awesome work. And the, the neat thing is God opened the door for us to start a church service at the psychiatric ward of a prison for women. So, That's awesome. So God's going to take what you went through and came right. out of and let you minister to those women in that psych ward. Right. And they see me come in and they think, oh, well, you're just some church lady. You don't know what this is like. But I'll share my testimony and say I was I was That innermost too. chamber with the Thorazine, that's, right. that's not just some church lady. That's right. I know that Thorazine shuffle, and God delivered me from that. And I, when you speak that to them, I mean, they get a hold of that. That's right. I was told I'd be on medication forever, and that's not true. God delivered me, and I haven't been on any medication in eight years, and I've had more joy than I've ever had in my whole life. You know, there are a lot of people maybe watching the show or have some relatives or something that have gone through some of the same things you've gone through. Would you just look at your camera and just talk to them and pray? I would love All to. Right. Just look right at your camera. Okay. If you've been where I've been, then you can understand the despair and the hopelessness that can surround you. But I want to tell you today that Jesus came to set us free. He said he came that we might live life more abundantly, that we might have more joy. And he's given me so much more joy than any drug or alcohol could ever do. And for family members, if you know someone, especially a child that's gone in the wrong direction, don't lose hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. In 1 Timothy 1.1, it says, Jesus Christ is our hope. And it says we can pray for our family and you can take authority over the enemy and take a stand. Love is much more powerful than anything the enemy has to throw at anybody. And we are victorious through Christ and never lose hope. The doctor said I had no hope, but they were wrong. Don't believe a lie that there's no hope. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. I'd like to pray. Lord, I just ask that your spirit of truth would go forth now, Lord. I pray that your spirit would start speaking truth and to release those bondages that are out there, Lord. Touch people's heart. Open their eyes to your truth, Lord. Open their ears to your truth. Lord, I pray that you take those stony hearts, soften them, give us a heart of flesh, Lord. I pray that your love would just overpower each person out there, Lord. Family members and people in the struggle now and friends, Lord. Give us all direction. Give people wisdom, Lord. And put people in each of their paths, Lord, that would speak your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Tracy, thank you so much thank for being so on much. our show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's so encouraging. The first thing is to get born again. She had a vision. She saw Jesus, and God came to live inside of her and began to set her free. But it's a process. Yeah, the enemy came back, and she tried suicide one more time. But that was it of suicide. Of course, we all fall along the way. We get back up because we say, hey, God, I missed it. But I'm turning back to you, and I'm turning away from that old junk. And he'll come along, and he'll pick us up and help us. The Holy Spirit is our helper, and he comes to live in us when we're born again. But God gives every one of us a measure of faith to receive the free gift. You know, it's not us. God does the surgery. All we have to do is ask, and he'll give us a brand new heart. And that's what happened to Tracy. And if you'll ask him, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, say, Lord, just come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Lord, I want to trust you. I'm tired of doing it my way. And God will come in. You just have to invite him and believe in your heart. Confess. Say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord. It really works. And it'll begin to set you free. Some things fall away just like that. Other things, it's a process. Mm -hmm. But as we walk it out, get into God's Word, get planted in a Spirit-filled, Bible-believing church, the Word of God will begin to wash us as we get into it, and the junk will fall away, and we'll read these promises, and they'll be for every one of us as believers. And then God has a good plan, and a plan with the future for all of us, because we're His children. Well, I want to thank you for watching our show. Tracy, I enjoyed it. I know it touched a lot of people. I would love for you to call the number at the end of the show. My wife, Latrice, and I would love to pray for you. You can also go to the website, howtobeattheodds.com. we got some streaming videos. There are several of our shows there you can watch instantly that deal with all different kinds of addictions and problems that people have had. And Jesus set them free, too. Thanks again for watching our show. We'll see you next time on How to Beat the Odds. I was awakened in the morning by a knocking on the door So I got up and went to see what all the knocking was for There stood the devil with a box addressed to me He said, boy, I got something here I think you ought to see I said, I know that I don't want it if it's anything from you Cause I hate everything you say and don't like anything you do Then he pointed with his finger and he smiled kind of sly Cause the package said from God they're in the corner way up high So I said if it's from God then why'd he send it here by you?